We are live. Welcome to 1981's Scanners Review and Thoughts. Now, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I really loved. This video will have some jokes and I will get into some serious stuff. Now, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger. Until I'm done with the spoilers, you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. And as soon as I end the review itself and get into the thoughts sections, I will be spoiling everything about the movie, including the ending. Now, that brings... So, so yeah. This movie is rated R, and so is this video. And, yeah, I, I'm guessing it's because of the violence that it is rated R, but it doesn't say on IMDb. And that... Right, so the... Yeah, let's see, the first... I believe it was around probably 99 that I watched this the first time. And this, I don't think I've watched this one that many times over the years, even though I've owned a DVD since back then. Now, let's see. So, yes, the plot. I am going to keep it vague and just say that the movie is set in a world where... Some people have telepathic ability, and I th think, yeah, that's that's all I will give away about it now. I am doing, you know, I, I made sure to put them all, all behind me. I am doing videos on all of the Cronenberg movies that I have, you know, yeah, that I have a copy of and a couple where I know, you know, I can get it from the library or that sort of thing. Huh, I just realized I forgot to put Videodrome up there. But yeah, I started with Videodrome for, you know, 2022, you know, Spooktober where I did one horror movie every week, you know, all five weeks of, all, all five Saturdays of the month. And, yeah, now I'm doing the Scanner Trilogy, and after that I will be doing, you know, the, the rest of the movies that I have access to by him in chronological order. I realize that this movie came out before Videodrome, but... The, you know, that I, I am more passionate about Videodrome than this movie, so I wanted to do that one first. And it won't it won't be every single week that I, I do one. I, I really don't want to risk just getting ah, burned out, you know. So I will be doing other... Let's see, I guess right now it is roughly one per month, I think, is the... Plan. Yeah, yeah. Currently, it's it's one of, yeah. First, the Scanner trilogy, and then one David Cronenberg movie per month until I've done all the ones that. Yeah, I guess I could briefly, you know, other than the ones that you see behind me. Yeah, and I, I realized, you know, Push is obviously not David Cronenberg, but you know, various people compared it to to this so you know and and push i have already done at least one video on i i don't in, intend to do more videos on it other than the ones you see behind i i guess yeah and if you don't know what you're looking at okay so the scanners trilogy then i guess you know what i will i will get them in the chronological order because i have them on the list ah uh, let's see i guess the there we go okay so after the Scanners Trilogy, it will be Naked Lunch, Hist Spider, A History of Violence, Eastern Promises, and finally Cosmopolis. And then I will be moving on to a different 
series where it, it I have other directors where I, I really enjoy multiple of their movies and have access to so yeah now that brings us yes so the writing so this was written by David Cronenberg who has 18 movie feature movie credits although you know two of them are based on original characters created by for the two scanner sequels which he otherwise has nothing to do with yeah and uh, right and and let's see there's at least one um maybe two that where he wrote a segment of the feature he didn't write the entire feature and let's see yeah so he he um you know the the writing here he really does a good job of bringing up interesting ideas not all of them get a lot of time to you know in in the movie to explore them but i would say that they get enough time you know nothing feels like he just tried to cram it in because he was he refused to kill his darlings now according to imdb trivia william s burroughs 1959 novel naked lunch contains a chapter concerning senders a hostile organization of telepaths bent on world domination a clear literary inspiration for this film and cronenberg will later direct a film version of naked lunch which came out in 1991. a very early treatment from 1976 entitled telepathy 2000 takes place in the future begins with the protagonist, who's named Harley Quinn, telepathically raping a woman in a subway, and was set as a spy movie. In this version, a company called Cytodyne Amalgamate was breeding evil scanners to take over the world, and the U.S. government was employing good scanners to stop them. So, yeah, that does sound very interesting. Wow, I yeah, I remember when everything had to be called something-something 2000. To, anyway, and uh, I've... Uh, yeah, one critic points out that all Cronenberg films are about identity, and that is very much the, the case here. And I can't really go into why and how the movie explores this without spoiling. So I am just going to go ahead and put a reminder once I get into the... There we go. Okay. There. So... The, yeah, the movie handles plot twists quite well. There are not too many. None of them are bad. They're not too few or too easy to figure out for the viewer. And it's not one of those movies that falls apart once you learn the twist. It's, it's one of those movies where the once you know the, you know, if you've only watched this movie once and you you think you'd be up for watching it at least one more time, I would recommend doing so because it really, like, what you learn in this film really changes how you view earlier scenes. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that benefits from watching multiple times and keeping the, the plot twist in mind. Don't you know, try to be surprised again, to try to try to apply this knowledge to the the, theme, the scenes when you watch them again. Which brings us to the direction. So, let's see, the, yeah, Cronenberg has directed 24 movies, although again, uh, let's see, I guess two or three of them are segments. I have been a fan of Cronenberg since at least the early 2000s. I've watched every movie of his I could get a copy of. Now, ranked worst to best, keeping in mind I love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. Brood, Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Spider, History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Existence, Fly, Videodrome. That's right. In my opinion, Fly defeats Spider, not the other way around. And, yeah, you might have noticed I did not include scanners there. I meant to say before, 
I will be including scanners in the ranking at the end of the review. But yeah, now you know how I feel about the rest of his filmography. And like every Cronenberg film I've just mentioned having watched, this doesn't quite take place in the real world. I've, I've seen some uh, user reviews be frustrated by aspects of the film that they felt they, they had trouble reconciling with the real world. And I think it's very important to just remember this is not set in the real world. Just, that is not something, I, I, I don't think David Cronenberg is particularly interested in stories set in the real world where things, you know, happen based on things that can happen in the real world. I think he would find that very constraining. Now, let's see. Right, according to IMDb, David Cronenberg once called this the most frustrating film he'd ever made. The film was rushed through production. Filming had to begin without a finished script and end within roughly two months so the financing would qualify as a tax write-off, forcing Cronenberg to write and shoot at the same time. He also cited difficulty with an antagonism between the leads, particularly Patrick McGowan and R.I.P. and Jennifer O'Neill. And... Yeah, his script got a lot better once he wasn't forced to, to rush. And I would definitely say he he does what he can to, to hide these, you know, this, this issue. And yeah, you, you know, if you are, if you look closely, you can see evidence of it in this and Videodrome. I feel... I forget about The Brood, but I think also in that one, and, you know, yeah. But ultimately, it, yeah, it works out well, considering that he had to, to write, yeah. The story itself is great, the plot of the film is good, the portions, uh, let's see... Yeah, the pacing is good, the film rarely stands still, constantly pushes the characters into situations, and the audience are brought along for the ride. Kronberg understands pacing quite well, since it leaves just enough room for the audience to absorb all of the information told, while almost constantly throwing the characters into intense situations. And, let's... See, right, you know, when I... Yeah, when I prepared my video drum video, one of the re critic reviews said, you know, yeah, Kronberg followed up Brood with Scanners, a hastily written and filmed flick about an... Uh, let's see... Yeah. With its shotgun battles, trench coats, night scenes, and fast pace, the film plays like a schlocky version of James Cameron's, another Canadian, Terminator. Which, there's definitely some truth to that. I, I had not thought about that, but there's definitely some, some Terminator vibe going on here, which is... Yeah... I, I gotta say, I never thought about that until, yeah, uh, let's see, when did I read this, I guess, a couple of months ago by now, so, yeah, let's see, yeah, Another, some, some more critic quotes, this is one of the most coherent films made by Cronenberg, as far as story goes, very true, let's see, yeah, some people felt there are stretches of the movie where very little happens, I'm not sure I would really, s I guess, yeah, okay, Plot-wise, not much happens, but there's always something interesting. You know, they're exploring ideas instead of furthering the plot. That is true. David Cronenberg is equally as interested in what the, scanner, the scanners can do as he is in them as, the, you know, the people that they are. Let's see... To me, this is the best X-Men film ever made. Allegory for society's treatment of minority groups and all. Let's see. It, it, there's definitely... Yeah, it's it's wild that... I'm going to add that to... Because this is also a spoiler, but yeah. Uh, let's see. So... Like an R-rated X-Men, except everyone has the same powers. And... Hmm. 
Scanners works well as a trashy B-movie, a brain-busting sci-fi comic book in the vein of John Carpenter's movies De Palma's The Fury or Cameron's The Terminator. Scanners was the first film Cronenberg had a bit of dough to work with. The budget was four million a hundred thousand Canadian dollars as opposed to the one million four hundred thousand Canadian for his okay this says far better 1979 effort the brood I I'll get into whether or not I agree with that at the end of the review however there was some tax shelter tax shelter system that forced Cronenberg to finish shooting by the end of 1980 which was difficult because Cronenberg began without a completed script the result is he'd get up and write some scenes then give them to the crew so they could find a location to shoot them that day with the actors learning their lines in the meantime nonetheless while scanners cannot match the brood for terror or especially conceptually the the film is clearly superior from every technical perspective and yeah, I would definitely say you can see some in the acting that they only that they only had a little time to learn their lines, especially the ones with a lot of dialogue. The there are definitely some yeah. Let's see. David Cronenberg's coolly clinical sci-fi scanners is mind-blowing art for outsiders. Let's see. Okay, so, yeah, um, the philosopher's point of view. Reductionists like Sam Harris say the self is illusory, a wholly subjective experience that's not as it seems, echoing what David Hume said. Basically, that since no impression is a persistent thing, there cannot be a persistent self. This is ratcheted up a thousandfold when the beings are experiencing hundreds of impressions simultaneously, and that much more intensely. Let's see. And and that it, it yeah, uh, I'm not I don't have like a philosophy degree, but I think I understood that. And if I did, then I agree with it. Now the opening I'm not going to get into the details here, but it's a powerful introduction. I if if you haven't watched it yet, do not read. If you know if you start to read a review and it says something like the movie starts with. You know, skip skip ahead in the review. Do not let anybody spoil the the intro. I, and apparently, yeah, it it wasn't originally supposed to be the first scene. I'm really glad that Cronenberg decided to make it the first scene. Now, the opening titles are just green text and basic font on black screen, but the music is really you know yeah the music's excellent throughout. So. I'll get to that later in the review. I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. I, I'm i not sure I would say the ending is, like, amazing, but it is good. And, yeah, I'm not sure that the the ending could have been much better, but, you know... I, I don't know, uh, maybe it's not really fair to compare, you know, but for example, the ending to Videodrome is just pitch perfect, you know, I love that ending, and the ending to The Fly is also very strong, but ultimately, I guess, and, and I do know, I, I, I'm aware that some people do think the ending to this movie is just absolutely amazing, I suppose the thing that the ending is mainly about is not the thing I found most fascinating about the movie, I suppose. You know, like I mentioned, it brings up various ideas and explores them, and the ideas that I've, that, that the movie explores that I found most compelling are not that heavily, you know, that, that's not really what the ending is about. About so much and that that's why it does but it is still it's it's you know I, I don't I, I from what I recall all of his movies have really good endings you know and it is very difficult endings endings are always difficult but he works in you know a lot of his movies are horror movies horror movies are really really difficult and, yeah, the ending doesn't rely on Deus Ex Machina, or the convenient writing. 
it, it feels like a logical conclusion. And the ending titles emulate something seen earlier in the film. Quite clever. I'm not going to give it away. And that brings us to the characters. So the lead here is Stephen Lack as Cameron Vale. And yeah, a, a number of people... A number of people have criticized his acting talent, and I don't feel good, like, from what I hear, he's now an artist, and, you know, apparently quite a good one. It's, I, I feel bad criticizing people who, you know, like, clearly he realized he had some creative spark, and he maybe at first thought that... It meant he would make a good actor, and later it turned out it made him a really good artist. You know, I, I, I'm not always against criticizing acting, but I feel like, like, if you're someone who... Yeah, off the top of my head, I don't like when... I'm gonna... I can't remember his name, but I'll find it really quickly because he directed The Sixth Sense. His name is M. Night Shyamalan. I do not like when he puts himself in his movies. I think he has directed multiple really strong movies, such as Unbreakable and Split, but I do not think he is a particularly good actor. And I know, you know, I, I don't know if he still fancies himself the new Hitchcock, but that was something that some reviewers called him, and it kind of went to his head, but when you look at Hitchcock's cameos in his movies, it never detracted from the experience, like, he'll, he'll show up briefly walking through a shot, or in the background, or something, but... M. Night Shyamalan will write himself, like, multiple lines of dialogue, have the camera focused squarely on him, and he's just not a good actor. And given that he's such a good director, I, you know, it kind of just feels like ego, you know? He, it's, it's like he won't quite acknowledge that he's not that good of an... I don't know if he, like, let's see, the most recent, what was it, of, uh, Old? Is that what it was called? Yeah, yeah, he directed Old, and I don't know if he put himself in that, but he is in Glass and Split, and yeah, the one that people really hated his appearance in was Lady in the Water, where he's like a supporting character. So, yeah, I, it feels to me like Ego. It feels to me like he can't admit to himself because he you know he watches this stuff back during the editing process he must realize that his performances are not good you know so yeah and and with Stephen Lack it doesn't feel like ego it I you know M. Night Shyamalan it feels like he's trying to act sure but with Stephen Lack it legitimately like yeah it feels like he's trying and I don't think he realized that he wasn't, that, that the performance wasn't all that good. And, you know, yeah, he never really had a chance to learn his lines, and they rarely had time for more than two takes, so there's also no time for him to improve on set. So, yeah. And, let's see, one critic, uh, I think, that, yeah, I think this was a user review. He's in another Canadian movie, I forget the name, but apparently he's amazing in it. Let's see, and, uh, yeah... Let's see, some theorize that he was cast for his face. We get many striking shots of the face. And one person said he reminds me of Ben Mendelsohn, but not as good of an actor. Let's see. I think I'm going to put this. There we go. And because that's technically kind of a spoiler, but... Yeah, 
his face is quite striking, for sure. And Patrick McGuhan, R.I.P., plays Dr. Paul Ruth, and he is quite good. Like, he has a very commanding presence, and he is involved in the whole... Yeah, let's see. I mentioned that telepathy is part of it. The title scanners refers to the people who have telepathic powers, and yeah, yeah. They are referred to as scanners, and them using their powers is referred to as scanning. So, yeah, but he's he's involved with the scanners. I don't think I want to give away exactly how, because it's not revealed immediately. And Jennifer O'Neill, as Kim O'Brist, she's good. She does not have... She doesn't have as much screen time as you might think, and I think maybe her character would be better served if they gave her some more scenes, but that's, you know, if, if they didn't have a finished script, like, by the time Cronenberg realized, or, or, yeah, yeah, by the time he could get a good overview of how much time we get with her character, it might have been too late to go back and give her more screen time. Let's see. Right. Lawrence Dane, RIP, plays Braden Keller. He's also very like this this is a movie where the the major characters, several of them, are very commanding presence. You know, pres presences. And the movie is much better for it. It, he actually, yeah, he fares pretty decently. He does. There are scenes where he has a bunch of lines. Yeah, him and him and McGuhan both have have a lot of lines and actually pull it off quite well. So, yeah, that's you know, but but yeah, um, Stephen Lack is one of the people who you know not in all scenes and certainly not from right away. But in some scenes, he has a lot of dialogue, and he's not, it's not like spellbinding acting. Michael Ironside plays Daryl Revick, and I'm not, I refuse to give away exactly what he's playing in, in, the, in the review section. I will talk a little about him in the thought section, unless I forget at least. This film is how Canadian Michael Ironside was discovered, and you know, since... This movie, he has done many American movies. You know, he is he is amazing in Starship Troopers. You know, he he played Sam Fisher until, but not including the uh, what was it called again? Blacklist. And yeah, those those are the prim he's also quite good in. The uh, the machinist, and yeah, I it's it's wild. And originally, he wasn't even supposed to be in a huge amount of this movie, but because of his screen presence, like Cronenberg was like, okay, I I gotta get him in more of the movie. He's he's too good to only be yeah, deeply compelling as usual. And there's a there's a charisma to him that just yeah, and I think. Those are the ones I am going to talk about. So, let's see. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's not particularly the, the uh, what's the word? Diversity is, is kind of lacking. It's mostly white dudes and the occasional white woman. But, you know... Yeah, for, for the time it is to be expected. Now, the dialogue has to get across a lot of exposition and characterization. You know, you get the sense that David Cronenberg knew... He, he had a good idea of what he wanted out of this movie, but having to, you know, write... Yeah write a scene the same day that they go and find a location and shoot it 
and and you know get get the lines to the to the actors and everything yeah there are times in this movie where one or more characters will let's see just basically explain things give give backstory and that kind of thing and basically the the it's never one of those things where it's just two characters saying to each other what both of them already know you know there's at least one scene where it could have become that but instead it's framed at ba as basically like a discussion so you know yeah both of these people know some of the things that the other person is saying but it's because they're trying to convince a third person you know both of them are com trying to convince the third person that they are right in what they are you know trying to what they're arguing for so yeah you know and yeah by the end of this movie like i w yeah i would i would say the movie always conveys the information that you need to know you know some sometimes it will only you'll only be told right at the last moment but there isn't really any scene where like there was something super important and we only found out afterwards you know which i know low bar but for a movie where they wrote the scene you know cam eh, not cameron cronenberg had to write the scene the same day they shot it you could you you could forgive him for maybe you know forgetting at least something you know if if you've ever you know i, I realize not everybody watching this video has has tried writing you know, and, and for sure, writing is not for everyone. I, you know, I used to think it was for me. It absolutely is not. That is not something that I, you know, I'm proud of some of the stuff I wrote, but it is not really the kind of thing that I, you know, I, I actually, yeah, before I started doing YouTube videos, I would only write reviews. And, you know, I, I do still write reviews, but now my you know, my passion is these videos. If you've never tried writing, you, you you can just try, just just like sit down for maybe an hour and just try, try to think up something, you know, some kind of, it doesn't have to be a whole story, just a scene or something and try to write it and try to not write past that one hour and, you know, yeah, you know, go back and, and correct if you feel like something you wrote could be better and see how you feel after that hour and then imagine doing that for, like, what was it, two months of move of film shooting? Like, that is just, yeah, no wonder he was frustrated. You know, ultimately, it does mean some of the dialogue is not super, like... The, the, the writing and the delivery of it are not absolutely amazing all the time. But again, some of it is really, really strong. Uh, you know, the, the um, Ironside, McGuhan, and... Uh, what was his name? Dane are all quite good. Uh, you know, at, at delivering. But yeah, sometimes it is, you know, it's it's very utilitarian at times, which is something in general, you know, Cronenberg is one of those directors who have been described as, you know, he's he's very, he's all about the, the technical aspects. He doesn't completely, like, his, his, the way he writes characters sometimes feels like he doesn't completely, what's the word? Like, maybe he doesn't know very many normal people anymore. Uh, you know, that that was something, for sure, I remember people criticized about a history of violence. I'm not sure that I would say it's it fits here. But, but for sure, 
you know, there are times where the dialogue is just, we, we got to get this information out and we got to finish writing so we can find a place to shoot so we can shoot. So just, yeah. Now, the cinematography was handled by Mark Irwin, who I believe, I can't, I forgot to write it in, but I'm pretty sure he has other Cronenberg credits. And yeah, so he has 78 credits as a cinematographer on feature films including what is it two that have not come out or hadn't come out when i copied this in which was months ago let's see the i let's see okay so right videodrome the dead zone the fly the brood I, let's see, is Fast Company, I think Fast Company is our, also one of, yeah, so, you know, they had a good working relationship, they worked on a number of movies together, and the, the, let's see, there are definitely some times where the cinematography gets quite, like, unusual, to to um to help us better understand the scanning and it works well for you know it the movie is in part an action movie which is is wild for you know considering he's not really known for action but yeah he the 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 action is well shot i was never confused as to what was going on, or the, let's see, the, the, um, yeah, the, what was going on, why, and, which is extremely important, when you have people who can move things with their mind, all kinds of things, it's extremely important that the audience isn't confused as to why is, you know, why exactly is this thing happening? And, you know, what if there's more than one scanner in a scene? Which one is using, is, is scanning? Which one is, is moving things? The, the movie makes that very clear with the cinematography, and that brings me nicely into the editing, which was handled by Ronald Sanders, who has 33 credits as editor, and he actually worked on... A bunch of this yeah right he has edited a bunch of okay so just real quick other than this one there's fast company videodrome dead zone fly dead ringers naked lunch and butterfly crash existence spider a history of violence eastern promises a dangerous method cosmopolis and maps to the stars so yeah the the two of them must have an a really good working relationship to be working together for so you know he he kept working they kept working together even once Cronenberg went to America and started making you know movies that some have described as more mainstream I don't completely agree that the movies are you know I, th I think some people mistake them for being more mainstream than they are but I will get to that when I get to that when I start talking about, when I, when I do videos on History of Violence and Eastern Promises. But, but yeah, um, you know, when it's, it's a movie where sometimes people will attack one another, and it's extremely important that it is edited so that we aren't confused, and yeah, they, they did a, Really excellent job. I'm just going to make sure. There we go. Now. That brings us to... So yeah, the, the budget. This had... 
yeah, the, the budget, once again, four million one hundred thousand Canadian dollars, and the box office was fourteen point two million. So this was one of his successful movies, and it does do a, a good job. Like it doesn't feel like they're constantly almost running out of money. You know the the. It, it fares better than, and I realize this isn't a completely fair comparison, Robert Rodriguez, El Mariachi. And I bring that up because Rodriguez has since shown that he is capable of so much more than that. But, and, and I realize that movie had, I want to say, a $7,000 budget, you know, and barely... Like, skeleton crew kind of thing. So, what what I'm, what I'm I mean is, El Mariachi, even if nobody told you that it's a low-budget movie, you're still, there are some, some things that reveal that it is low-budget. And, ultimately, you know, it's, it's important to remember, he didn't, expect that to become a big movie. He was just going to make something cheap and fast for the Mexican video market. You know, it it was supposed to be a direct-to-video movie. And then, I forget who, but some American producer or something, you know, got a whiff of it and was like, we could sell this. Like, we can, we could, you know, pe people are going to pay to watch this, you know. And... You know, but but yeah, what I mean is what what I'm getting at is this movie doesn't really have shots or really entire elements like that movie does that belie that it wasn't. You know, that when when Rodriguez started shooting, he had a finished script. He was sure of what he he wanted, and he's not trying to explore ideas. He realized that he wasn't going to have enough footage, so he started shooting dream sequences. And, you know, they, they work, you know, they add to the movie, sure, but it is the kind of thing where, you know, I, I, I don't think there's anything in this movie where, you know, certainly nothing in this movie feels like it's just there to pad out the runtime or you know, to cover up because they didn't have enough money to, like, you know, several of the action scenes feel like the movie had a bigger budget than it does. You know, they feel they feel sufficient for a 1981 action movie that isn't, you know, a huge blockbuster. Obviously, you know, it's not going to compete with, you know, yeah, one one of the really big budget like a a Rambo or you know, yeah, that that kind of thing. Now, yeah, so this was filmed in Quebec, in Canada, which, oh, right, and Ontario, but, yeah, all, yeah, because cause that was where the, where the crew could get to in a reasonably short amount of time and get permission to shoot and, and this whole thing, so, and they, yeah, they did a pretty good job, right, they filmed between the 30th of October in 79 to the tw and the 23rd of December. And, yeah, it does not feel, you know, so sometimes it can kind of feel like they, oh, they just went, or and that's another, you know, El Mariachi. That movie does wisely say, oh, no, no, this is going on within a fairly small, you know, it's not a globe-trotting adventure. But, yeah. That movie, it you can tell. Okay, they just went around and and filmed in in places that were within driving distance, you know. And this legitimately, like, if I didn't, I I, I think I used to think it it was much more expensive. If I didn't know that it was four million, I probably would have guessed eight or maybe even twelve. Like, it really feels like. And, and, you know, part of that is that the crew making this, you know, they, they could afford, you know, uh, yeah, Cronenberg could afford people who knew exactly what they were doing, had a lot of experience with it, 
and the equipment for that. And that's another thing where El Mariachi, you know, he could barely afford, he couldn't even afford on-set audio. So the entire movie is dubbed after the fact. Now, that brings us very nicely into the action specifically. Now, this has chases on foot and in vehicles. There's shooting, including shooting while in vehicles, use of the scanning powers. If you haven't watched this, you might not believe that Cronenberg is good at doing action scenes since so many of his movies don't have any, but he really is quite good at it, and the variety is impressive for the budget. No two action scenes feel exactly the same. And again, you know, these are... It's, it's a story about scanners, which, you know, they... they I'm, I'm not going to get into exactly what, but it's just, it's psychic powers, you know, and... I could, you know, I, I think it would be understandable, and I hear that is what happened with the two sequels. I haven't watched either of them before. I, I will be watching them right before I do videos on them. You could understand if they ended up kind of doing the same thing over and over, because, you know, it's, it's psychic powers. Isn't that enough? A, l a lot of people making movies would think we, we just have to show that over and over again, you know, because... Because that in and of itself is so, so interesting that we don't have to, but yeah, to his credit, Cronenberg made sure that all of them, uh, you know, um, I think I will, I'm going to briefly add a note. Let's see if we put it here. So. There we go. Now, that brings us to... Right, so I'm not going to give away the villain and or antagonist. I'm not going to give away whether there is one or multiple. But they're definitely... The one or multiple, very memorable... And I suppose I will, yeah, that's, that's, that is all I will give for that. Now, the score of this is, is quite good. And, you know, the, the, let's see, right, yeah, this is, the, the composer for this also did, you know, he's he's perhaps best known for the Lord of the Rings. He did also score later Cronenberg than this. And, yeah, you, you might, based on that, you know, already know who, you know. So, yeah. Is the score composed by Howard? Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see... Right, he even did the, the new Crimes of the Future, and, yeah, Cosmopolis, Maps to the Stars, Eastern Promises, History of Violence, Spider, Crash, the, the Cronenberg Crash, rather than the, you know, Oscar Beatty Garbage Crash. Which makes the mistake of thinking of, of treating racism like it's a problem with for for individuals rather than systems. Let's see. Naked Lunch, Dead Ringers, The Fly, Videodrome, and The Brood. So yeah. And, yeah, he did an incredible job here. And actually, you know, there are 57 and a half minutes worth of the score for free right here on YouTube. Now, what I always say is make sure you also watch it. You know, it feels wrong to just listen to and, and not pay anyone. You know, make sure you also watch the movie is, is my request. But... Yeah, the original score, and I have a couple of credit quotes. So, yes, like The Fly, the music is full of life. Howard Shore's score is a fantastic blend of 1980s synths, synths, 
and subtle classic melodies. Shore raises the stakes with high tension, inducing passages of throbbing ambient noises and pulsating bass that reverberate in your mind during the mental battle sequences. Shore blasts through scanners with epic themes of synth dripping rhythms at first, then lovely piano at the next. Other quiet scenes have haunting and lovely melodic classical style music to accompany the uneasy tones of scanners around every corner. Shore's music is pretty classical and so, you know, others have compared it to an 80s John Carpenter style score, and that is very true. It, yeah, if I didn't know that it was Howard Shore, I might have guessed that it was like John Carpenter. Although, you know, I'm not sure that he, would he have scored a Canadian movie at the time? Yeah, but, and the, let's see. Yes, that brings us to the sound design, which is also really, really strong. And I have a critic quote. The sound design comes from a team of Cronenberg's finest, consisting of Charles R. Bowers, Peter Burgess, Don Cohen, Peter German, and Bruce Nisnikuping, who up the ante with the echoing voices and sudden pangs of sound. This is hugely effective and extremely important. Scanning doesn't exist in the real world. They can't get the finished audio from a real source. But it is vital to the film's success that the audience understand what it's like being a scanner. This movie would not be one-tenth of what it is if not for the fact that we can basically, we, we can really empathize with the scanners. It's, we're not outsiders looking in. We're basically, we hear what they hear, uh, you know, and yeah, it, it's, it's such... Yeah, so amazingly well done. That's also something that I hear that one or both of the sequels do not manage. And that's, you know, they are both much lower budget. And yeah. Let's see. Yeah, so the, the movie is an hour and 35 minutes long without end credits and 38 and a half long with them. And you don't need to sit through the end credits. You know, I personally did because the music is so good, but there, you know, there's nothing at the end of the end credits, and the end credits themselves, I already mentioned, they, they imitate this stylistic choice, but they don't have anything, like, yeah, there's not really anything in the end credits that you would want to, yeah. And, let's see... Yeah, I would, I would say if after 30 minutes of watching, if you're not interested in the rest, then you might as well stop watching. There's not really going to be anything after that. And yeah, so the best element is the, the, the themes, the, the exploration of themes and, and the choice of themes. That's, those are the two best elements and they're tied. The worst aspect is that it you can definitely tell that it was a rushed production. They they did an incredible job considering, but there are times where, where you can tell. Now so yeah, the the worst thing according to others is that it is a bit you know, the the yeah, the the complaint I ran into the most was that People found it too difficult to believe that these things were, were happening. Now, yeah, the thing I was most worried about were the issues caused by the incomplete script, and I would say the movie impressed me, con considering that it, it did not live down to my expectations that exceeded them. And the thing I was most looking forward to was the Cronenberg touch, and the movie exceeded my expectations. Now... Yeah, so the trailer definitely gives away too much. Actually, yeah, right, I found two trailers, and technically one of them is just one of the scenes from the movie. So, like, if you start to watch what you think is a trailer, and it's, it's you know, basically, yeah, it's, it's around two minutes long. If you start to watch a two-minute-long trailer, and you feel like this is, this is not a trailer, this is just a scene, stop watching, you, you know, it's the... It's a scene that's in the movie, and you'll want to watch it in the movie, in the context of the movie, instead. 
but there is also a one minute trailer it does also give too much away and it's definitely difficult to advertise this kind of movie without giving too much away because so much of the most interesting stuff in the movie you, you know some of it you learn very early on but you're not expected to know it before you come into the movie you know and and the movie works really well probably better if you don't know it before you start watching if you learn through watching the movie and oh right the the poster uh i let's see yeah uh the cover and poster absolutely give too much away and this you know this is back when i don't know i guess actually yeah some sometimes they still do it but they yeah there's a huge spoiler in the poster and, and cover and i think as it is behind me it's it's too far away from the camera that you can really completely tell what it is yeah but but yeah if you know that's the th how how do you how do you start watching this movie without it some well actually yeah i guess if it's on a streaming site maybe you can see the title before you see the the poster itself but yeah now let's see yeah so i did not find very much here on youtube uh there's a handful of clips of it and the two trailers, about half a dozen TV spots, some of them fan ones, 14 review and analysis, and four reactions. This has a 68% on the tomato meter, based on 41 reviews, only 13 of them rotten, and a 64% audience score based on over 25,000 ratings. And the consensus is Scanners is a dark sci-fi story with special effects that will make your head explode. And the average critic rating was 6.60 out of 10. The average user score was 3.5 out of 5. So the movie is fresh. And on Metacritic, it has a 60 out of 100 based on 8 critic reviews. And let's see, an 8.3 user score based on 97. And let's see, I'm just really quickly gonna... Okay, yeah, so the of the eight critic reviews, four are positive and four are mixed. None of them are negative. And of the 97 user ratings, 81 are positive, 12 are mixed, and only four are negative. So, yeah, this is fairly well liked. There are only 224 IMDb user reviews for this. So, I just read all of them. Normally, I only read the top voted 100, but when there's that few, I might as well, yeah. So, of the top 100, none of them have 1 out of 10. Three of them were rated 2 out of 10. Three were rated 3 out of 10. Six were rated 4. 4 were rated 5, 9 were rated 6, 25 were rated 7, 26 were rated 8, 9 were rated 9, and 11 were rated 10. So yeah, this has been fairly well received. And there's 147 links to IMDb external reviews, and 107 of them worked and were in English. And the overall... The, the weighted average vote on IMDb is 6.7 based on 55,113 IMDb user ratings. And let's see. So yeah, 32.9% gave it 7, 21.3 gave it 6, 19.0 gave it 8, let's see, 8.5 gave it 5, 6.1 gave it 9, 5.5 gave it 10, 3.4 gave it 4, 1.5 gave it 3, and less than 1% gave it 1 and 2 both. So, yeah, fairly well received, but still a 
a chunk of people who really don't think very highly of it. And I can, I can understand why. Um, you know, a number of people will be very bothered by the, the violence and some of the ideas, you know, brought up in the movie. And others will think that, or have thought, that it just is not well produced enough to deserve a high rating. You know, for sure, some of the low ratings are based on acting. You know, the, the, of, of the lead. And it's kind of important for the lead to, to be compelling. So, yeah. Now, it won three awards. Were nominated for nine. Let's see. Yeah. Dick Smith got a, a Saturn Award for Best Makeup. That makes a ton of sense. It was nominated for... Let's see. Uh, Best Special Effects by Gary Zeller. It won Best Film at the International Fantasy Film Award. And it was nominated for Best Motion Picture, Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role for Michael Ironside. How did that not win? But anyway, yeah. Um, Best Achievement in Direction, Best Screenplay Original, Best Achievement in Art Direction for Carol Spear. And that makes a lot of sense. She's immensely talented. I, I, I do not know why I forgot to bring her up when I got to it. Yeah, she, like... the crown jewel of her art direction in this movie. You you visit this place full of of art pieces and just like you realize that when you watch a movie that has original art, that means that the art direction the, the art director has to be an artist, basically. You know, they have to make something that you can look at on the big screen and say an artist made that. That was not just made for a movie. And just the art on display is is just amazing. You know, I, honestly, I would almost say it's worth watching at least once just to see those art pieces. They're, and I'm not usually, like, when I when I want to, to take in something that's going to stimulate monogamy, I tend to go for movies or video games or music. I am not usually into art because we are talking like traditional definition of art. We are, this movie features sculptures and I have never been into sculptures and it's not for lack of trying on the part of both of my parents who, you know, before my father retired, before my mother died, were both teachers. You know, they're all about, you know, so, so, yeah. But it's really, really impressive here. And it's definitely, it's not for everyone. If if you don't, do not make this the first Cronenberg movie. Although I don't, I'm not sure I can think of one of a Cronenberg movie that I would say, that sh that's that one's fine. You can you can watch that as the best as the first one, and you won't be like overwhelmed. You know, actually, rather, what I will say is the first time you watch a Cronenberg movie, accept that you might have to pause it along the way because they are very overpowering. Right. It also was nominated for best achievement in costume design for Delphine White. That is true. Some really great costumes as well. Best Achievement in Film Editing, which I've already praised. Best Achievement in Overall Sound, which I've also gone into. The special effects are very, very impressive. Like, the, um, I can't, I, I refuse to give it away in the review itself, but I will talk about it in the... I'm just going to write myself a note to remember to do that. So, there we go. Talk about FX. There. And there we go. So, yeah. Th this really is, uh, you know, in, in addition to be to being good for their time, they also hold up. Like, there's a, there, there are a couple of effects in this. I've watched this movie before, and I've watched other Cronenberg, but they still really get to me. Like, they get a visceral reaction. Like, I I just, ugh, you know, and it's just, yeah, amazing work. 
you know, up to the standard of other 1981, you know, yeah, in, in general, David Cronenberg, you know, response, uh, directed movies with incredible effects. He's not the effects creator himself. And, you know, John Carpenter, 80s output. One of the people responsible for the excellent special effects on this movie are Dick Smith, who did not live up to his parents' hopes for his career when they named him, which is, of course, plastic surgeon for Richmond's nether regions. There's also some really great stunt work, and this is one of those movies that doesn't try to hide the stunts with, like, editing. Like, there was one part where actually, like, someone was, you know, like, thrown out of frame, and for, like, a fraction of a second, I was like, that doesn't seem right. It's not. It's not like David Cronenberg to not show us the full stunt. And sure enough, it then cuts to the proper stunt, which is quite, like... I don't even know how some of this stuff was safely done, but, you know, yeah. And that brings... I don't always talk about the violence and gore in the review itself. This is one case where I want to say... If you if this is the first Cronenberg movie you watch, then his reputation probably precedes him. You might expect this to be. Yeah, I I, I just realized that was that was a push quote. I, I watched it yesterday to compare this to it. Anyway, his reputation precedes him. This is not you know, there is some very intense and graphic violence in this movie, but there's not a lot of individual scenes of a lot of graphic violence. You know, there's there's violent scenes, you know, there's there's more than a few violent scenes in this movie, but a lot of them, it doesn't, it's it's not the really graphic kind of violence that we're used to from, from Carpenter. Ah, Cronenberg, wow. And... You know, don't don't let this sour the the experience. You know, if if you want something with just a ton of really graphic effects, you know, The Fly and Videodrome have a ton of it, and will also make you think. You know, I don't want to I don't want anyone leaving this video with the impression that I watch these movies just because they're really violent. Maybe I did as a teenager, but that's really besides the point. I don't know why you would even bring that up, honestly. That's that's completely irrelevant to the discussion. But yeah, today I do appreciate that there's something more going on there. It's, yeah. Let's see, that brings us to... Right, there's actually... In the Wikipedia for this movie, the, the legacy section... You know, yeah, it notes Scanner spawns sequels and a series of spin-offs. A remake was announced in 2007, but as of 2021, not gone into production. None of these projects had, has, uh, you know, yeah, have involved Cronenberg as director. And the remake in February 2007, Darren Lynn Bousman, director of Saws 2, 3, and 4, was announced as director of a remake of the film to be released by the Weinstein Company and Dimension Films. David S. Goyer was assigned to, to script the film. The film was planned for release on October 2008, but the day, date came and went without further announcements, and all the parties involved have since moved on to other projects. In an interview with Bowsman in 2013, he recalled that he would not make the film without Cronenberg's approval, which was not granted. I really respect that. I am not... I, I, I've only watched the first Soul. And I'm not really interested in pursuing the rest of, of the franchise. I'm not... You know, you're not wrong for liking it. It's just not my kind of thing. But I have a lot of respect for someone who would say, I'm not gonna... Lay, I, I'm not gonna remake a movie if the director of the original will not approve of of the project and it doesn't really surprise me that Cronenberg you know I've, I've just I very recently finished doing my research for Eastern Promises and apparently 
that movie was supposed to have a sequel. And, and like, I mean, I can understand, like, story-wise, I get it. But, like, Cronenberg making a sequel, like, that just seems completely, like, yeah. But, but yeah, S sequels and remakes, not really his kind of thing. I mean, yes, he has now made two movies called Crimes of the Future, but the second one is not a remake of the first one. I, I honestly don't know why they're called Crimes of the Future. I haven't watched either of them. Maybe I will at some point. But, yeah, uh, I was very surprised when I read that Eastern Promises might have a, a sequel. That, yeah, like, he might touch upon similar themes in multiple movies, but making an outright sequel just does not seem... Like, you know, for sure, Existence is a spiritual successor to Videodrome, but it's definitely not a sequel. You know, if you've watched both of those movies, definitely not sequel. It's, it's no, no... Yeah, but, but touching upon some similar themes, you know. Now, let's see. In July 2020, uh, 2011... Dimension was planning to develop a television series. As with the film reboot, no further announcements have been made regarding a TV series. Another attempt to develop the concept into a television series was announced in September 2017 by Media Res and Braun Studios. I will say, a TV series could be interesting. I'm not sure, like... I will talk about whether I think the the two sequels made sense to make based on the plots and the themes and such when I do video on them but off the top of my you know ba based on having watched the first one multiple times having done some research on those two movies I currently don't really think that they're going to it, it seems more like it's just people wanted more you know people latched on to certain things about this movie wanted more so more was made but you know Cronenberg had nothing to I, I'm not sure he you know it's it said he didn't direct them but I don't think he had anything to do was he even like produce I, I guess I could just very 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 quickly look up and see if he maybe did produce which also doesn't necessarily mean that he was like interested or Wait. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I was like, no, he has definitely produced stuff. Um, he is listed as producer for Eleven, and none of them are... Yeah, none, none of them are Scanners movies, so... But he has produced a couple of his own, including The Old Crimes of the Future, Dead Ringers, Crash, Existence, and... Spider. Oh, right, and Stereo. He he wrote. He he directed at least some of that one. So, anyway, yeah, the the yeah, he had nothing to do with the the sequels. Uh, you know the the yeah. I you know and and considering you know he has now had forty one years to make you know if not a sequel then a spiritual successor and I don't. Like, based on the... I, again, I haven't watched all of them, but I don't think he has written or directed any movie that... This is a very strange new system that I need to get used to for how IMDb lists one's credits. But, yeah, I don't think any of these are particularly... that, that You know, are, are movies that you could com consider spiritual successors yeah you know so nor that this one is a spiritual successor to something he did before so you know, pl please correct me in the comments if if i have that wrong i i don't know all of his movies i haven't read about the ones that i haven't watched other than the ones that i'm planning to do you know i haven't i haven't watched cosmopolis yet the other ones that I've mentioned I will do videos on are ones that I have watched at least once before. Now, let's 
yeah, I forget, did I mention that I have already done, other than Videodrome, I've done videos on Existens and A Dangerous Method. A Dangerous Method I did when it was in theaters. That's actually, is that the only, oh, right, right. That one and A History of Violence, I think are the only Cronenberg movies I've watched in theaters. Now, let's see, yeah, so... Yeah, I, I recommend this to big fans of Cronenberg and of this kind of, you know, yeah, if even if you don't necessarily want to engage with the ideas and such, if you just want the gore and violence, just keep in mind that it's not as, you know, it does get very, very extreme, but there, it's not as common in this one as exist uh, well, also Existence, actually, yeah. Existence, Videodrome, and Fly, The Fly, his Fly remake. But, yeah, if you just like movies about people with psychic powers, you know, yeah, you'll probably like this movie. Just, you know, keep in mind, it is R-rated. This is not, you know, one of the X-Men movies where, like, sure, there are some... There, there's some gnarly kills in some of those as well, but yeah, this goes much, much further than, yeah. Now, I only have the very bare bones DVD. I I feel like I've read that there are more, I'm, I'm not that interested in talking about that. I'm just very briefly, my version is the bare bones one. It has this brief bit of text about Cronenberg, Stephen Lack, Jennifer O'Neill, Patrick McGowan, and Michael Ironside. And three trailers, none of them for uh, um, Cronenberg movies. You know, this was back when it was considered, you know, yeah, it's a DVD, let's put a trailer on. You know, today it's like, why would you bother putting a trailer on a DVD? It's on YouTube. Anyway, you can stream this on Apple TV. And, yeah, I, I rate this 8 compelling ideas about telepathic powers out of 10. And yeah, I, I definitely think that the movie as a whole holds up. And let's see, I mean, like, like I said, this was fairly well received. It was financially successful, critically, at least today, there's, there's, you know, positive reviews. I'm not sure if all of them are from back when it first came out. You know, got sequels, got spin-offs, uh, you know, uh, that's, yeah, I'll just briefly, I I am doing Scanners 2 and Scanners 3, and I'm aware that Scanners 3 is sometimes referred to as Scanner Force. I am not doing Scanner Cop 1 or 2. I'm not necessarily saying that I'm against it, but I have not been able, you know what, I'll do another search right now. The times that I have searched for it on, wow, this doesn't have any, oh, here we go, okay, nope, oh, yeah, here we go, yeah, um, yeah, no, let's see, and the other big one that I use is this one, and if I do a search for scanner, yeah, it finds movies two and three on sale, but I got them on sale already years ago. I've been meaning to get to these for quite some years, and I keep finding other stuff that I also really want to do videos on. So, that brings us back to the ranking. Once again, this is worst to best, keeping in mind I love all of them, they're all amazing, I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. Every single David Cronenberg movie that I have watched, Brood, Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Scanners, Spider, History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Existence, Fly, and Videodrome. And that gets us all the way to the thoughts section, so this is when I get into spoilers, notes taken while watching. So just a brief, this is basically, 
you know, yeah, thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And after that, I will get into thoughts that I had before watching, things that where I'm going off my memories of the film as well as reviews that I've read and such. So, Cameron enters through the door labeled emergency exit only, so free, we know from right away something's off, you know. And I will be talking about the Cameron, more of Cameron's introduction in the next thought section, so skipping ahead to when he is inside the, the room and Dr. Paul brings all the, the people in. It's a very good detail that at first we can't tell that all these people are only thinking and not talking. You know, and, and let's see, what is it he later says? Uh, I was overwhelmed by the voices, but they weren't moving their lips. No, the voices without lips. You know, that like, that's such a good way of expressing that because like, if you don't think about telepathy and you just hear someone say voices without lips, like that's, it sounds like an abstract, it sounds like a, a Zen riddle or something. Did not mean to do that, I swear. A Zen riddle or something. But yeah, if you can hear everybody's voices all the time, you start to distinguish between the voices and the voices without lips. And yeah, you know, because if, if it's been a while since you watched it, we hear their voices as soon as they start, you know, pooling into the room. But at first, we're just seeing them from the side. We can't see clearly that they're not moving their mouths. And then once they're all sitting down, the camera pans across all of them. And we're still hearing the voices and they've now intensified. But we are not seeing anybody's lip move. And obviously, you know... Dr. Paul told them, do not speak. No matter what you do, I'm, tr I'm counting on you to not say a single word when you're in here, you know, because that would ruin the, you know, it's, it's, ah, let's see, the, the, um, yeah, you know, the, the, this, you know, Dr. Dr. Paul is on one hand testing, you know, yeah, he's testing, he's demonstrating, you know, he, he himself already has, you know, he knows that Cameron has powers, you know, he has been keeping tabs on him since Cameron came out of his wife's womb, uh, Dr. Paul's womb, not Cameron's womb, that would be interesting, but the, the, you know, he, as we learn at the end of the movie, he is, you know, Dr. Paul is the father of both Cameron and Daryl. And, yeah, you know, he, he does already know that, he, that Cameron has some powers, but it's perhaps in part to make sure, to, to see exactly how strong they are, and also to make it clear to Cameron this sort of thing, you know, so, so that they can talk about it. Uh, you know, Dr. Paul wasn't there when the, the, the they do discuss, they, they do talk about, you know, what, what happened with the, the woman. And he said, I didn't do that. She did that. She forced me to think, to, to focus on her. And then it happened, you know. And yeah, you know, the, the, yeah, to return to, so the scene, you know, at first, we just hear, you know, and we were like, okay, come, sh would you people shut up? Just, you know, but we're like, well, hustle and bustle, of course, they're, you know, they're, they're, because before you realize that they're only thinking, not talking, you think, oh, it's just like being on the subway, you know, as soon as people pull in, they're all talking, and it's, it gets to be just really annoying to listen to, but this is what it's like for him, even when people aren't talking. So this, the, the fact that we can't tell from right away that they're only thinking, not talking, leads us to understand what it's like to be Cameron, even though scanners don't exist in the real world. You know, so, so yeah, the, the movie 
Right. Of course, a scanner is reminiscent of people on the spectrum. They feel things intensely, can lead to trouble focusing, especially around other people who make them feel and think. And this can lead to difficulty functioning in society unless given some, some assistance. And we actually see later in the movie, some of the scanners who do well have managed to focus the scanning into creating art. Like, I want to say his name is Ben. You know, or maybe they help other people, you know, help each other manage it. And that's why they can manage it, you know. So it is like scanners need help in order to, you know, otherwise it's just like unbearable for them. And that's something that the movie does a really, really excellent job of establishing you know, and it is, and it is a concept that is brought up in the X-Men movies and push, but a lot of the characters we meet there have had time where they are aware of the power, whereas Cameron, when we first meet him, he doesn't really know that this isn't how it is for everyone. You know, he's, nobody has explained to him what this is like. He hasn't had a normal life up to this point so yeah you know dr paul has to explain to him. you know when when paul is explaining it to him cameron isn't like oh come on i know this stuff you know and it also enables dr paul to explain it to the audience because again scanners don't exist in the real world and actually you know people on the spectrum way less was known about them in 1981 like i I hope it's not going to get unbearable to listen to me say. I, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be saying it for at least some of the following. So if you watch every single video I do on a David Cronenberg movie, I hope it doesn't get unbearable to hear me say he was really, like, ahead of his time with some of this stuff. Like, he he understood the... the yeah, it's, it's really, really really impressive because it's not just you know this vague they have mental health problems it is very specifically like i i know some people personally who are on the spectrum and this is what they describe it's like you know and today you you're not always going to be you know you're not always going to find someone who's good at it but at the very least there are people who you know, have a basic idea of what being on the spectrum is, because if you're not on the spectrum, it is something you have to learn about. And people on the spectrum have to learn that not everybody is like that, you know. So, yeah, you know, because it's not just like, oh, you know, he's seeing things or which, you know, there are a number of different issues that can lead to hallucinations. And that's actually, you know, hallucinations is something that's explored in Videodrome, and there he also does a really great job exploring, you know, instead of just... Because there's, like, there are so many movies where, especially maybe especially horror movies and, like, crime thrillers, psychological thrillers, where the bad guy is hallucinating or he's hearing voices or there's some one kind of thing like that. Because for a while... People didn't have empathy for people who experienced that. They were just aware that it exists. And so for a while they were demonized when in real life, like studies show, people with mental health issues are more likely to be to, to be the targets of violence rather than the perpetrators. And yeah, you know, here we have something that clearly, I mean... I don't think that, l l let me think, uh, let's see, David Cronenberg was born in 1943, so when he made, the, let's, yeah, and he made this in, in 70, 79, he was working on, like, like, filming, and, and those, those, those scripting, this movie, so he would have been 36 years old, Let's see, does he have... I feel like he, I know at least one kid he has. Yeah, Brandon Cronenberg also 
has made at least one movie. Okay, I'm just very briefly gonna see if, let's see. Um, okay, yeah, so Cassandra Cronenberg was seven years old when the, let's see, um, when the, when the movie was in production, and she is, she has directed some, and she's, uh, Oh, first assistant, third, second assistant, and third assistant director, including on Naked, L Naked Lunch when she was 19. Do I have that right? Let's see. Cause, yeah, she was 19. A trainee assistant director. Wow. That is, that is quite the, the privilege at age 19 to be trainee director on one of your father's... But yeah, and she was, again, on M. Butterfly Crash. And, yeah, she has worked on movies that were not... Butterfly. Oh, American Psycho. Very nicely. Yeah. She was the third assistant director. There's not a single badly directed scene in that movie, so... Yeah. Anyway, it's possible that... When Cassandra was younger, that she had some issues that were... Ah, uh, let's see. I guess Wikipedia might have that. I'm, I swear I'm not going to spend forever on this, but... Cronenberg? Um, so, let's see. The... Oh. Uh, does she not have her own? Um... Let's see. Um, huh. Oh. Okay, I don't think I'm gonna get into... Wow. Okay. Um... Okay, I'm just very briefly... In a September 2013 interview, Cronenberg revealed that Roman Catholic film director Martin Scorsese admitted uh, to him he was intrigued by Cronenberg's early work, but was subsequent, subsequently terrified to meet him in person. Cronenberg responded to Scorsese, You're the guy who made Taxi Driver, and you're afraid to meet me. That is, yeah. Okay, so... Um... Yes. Uh, he did have some personal issues with Cassandra and Cassandra's mother in the... Uh, yeah, yeah, and before the before the making of... Let's see... Yeah, yeah, before the making of this. So it's possible that he, he based some of it on that, or maybe, like, he was reading psychological um, studies, I guess, you know... Because, like, even the concept, let me think, I, so, autis, autism spectrum, ah, uh, let's see, hmm, uh, hmm, I am not, oh, here we go, okay, history, so, Oh, wow. Okay. Um, the earliest well-documented case of autism is Hugh Blair of Borg in a 1747 court case. And then again in 1798. And... Yeah, so the 1910 was when the word autism was starting to be used, and let's see. Oh, and he, yeah, he was just defining symptoms of schizophrenia, and let's see. Yeah, and and Soviet child psychiatrist. Described a similar syndrome in Russian 
1925 and in German in 1926. So, let's see. Right, here we go. Yes, autism spectrum disorder can be traced back to the late 1930s. You know, so it was like, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm I'm having trouble finding where it is. Uh, uh, let's see, what's the word? Um, when the um, uh. Yeah, when it when it became known to to regular people. Wow. Okay, it took until 1980 for the DSM-3 to differentiate autism from childhood schizophrenia. Like we know today, those are not the same thing. But yeah, like um Okay, let me think. Could you read the the scanner syndrome as childhood schizophrenia i mean let's see i think let's see so so the thing yeah the piece of evidence to to go off of are the the fact that um you know, he feels like pe other people's voice, other people's thoughts are in his head. You could read that as schizophrenia. Uh, let's see. Okay, fair enough. Maybe you could, I, I don't want to, you know, he's not. I sometimes have an issue of putting people on a pedestal especially movie directors and i have to get better at not doing that so much it is possible that he was treating that that he was depicting scanner uh, uh, yeah scanner traits based on childhood schizophrenia but yeah you know for sure again w one of the things that really that i really appreciate about it is it is empathetic because cameron before he starts to be able to control it, he really is, like, other characters don't tend to have any empathy for him. And that's something I'm going to talk about in the next thought section. Hardly any of the people Dr. Paul brings in seem bothered that Cameron is clearly in distress, because a lot of people don't care about people that they've successfully othered. He looks like a mental health patient. You know, he's all in white. He's strapped to the bed. And they may have been told that he's unhoused, which, you know, that is technically correct. He, he at the start of the movie, he is unhoused. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I, I quite like the scene of Consec discussing whether or not you know, how, how should they deal with, with scanners? And, you know, once you've watched the entire movie, I, I gotta admit, I had actually forgotten the, the twists here, but, you know, I, I thought back to the, the earlier scenes. You know, and, and next time I watch... Well, actually, no, wait, never mind. I forgot about Keller. I did remember that Dr. Ruth was the father of Cameron and Daryl. But, yeah... You know, they have this discussion, you know, the, the Keller, the new head of security, says, we gotta stop looking into these scanners because you see what happened. One of them came in and he killed six people, you know, which is, you know, this is one of the movies where they actually have that right. You know, he blew up the other scanner's head. He, there were two in the car that he made crash then he had the the guy shoot two more and f the guy final and and then made the guy shoot himself so that is six people but but yeah you know keller is like we got to stop doing this and then later we realize keller's working with daryl daryl doesn't want the competition you know he the the less scanners are 
being made into weapons by Consec, the easier it will be for Daryl to take over the world. And, of course. And, you know, he has told Keller, as long as you work for me, I'm not going to hurt you. But, honestly, you know, considering his his speech at the end of the movie, which, like, he's way into, you know, this, um, what's it called? The, the, ah, supremacy, you know. He, he considers himself and other scanners to be better than, than human beings. Uh, ah, non-scanners. I'm going to go with non-scanners. Obviously, scanners are human beings. Ah, uh, let's see. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, we get exposition during that scene, but it makes sense that they're talking about it. You know, Dr. Paul points out this guy was really, really powerful. You know, if we could have someone like that, we'd be, you know, and yeah, I do actually have one person that I am going to be, you know, that, that, I, that we could send out there. Let's see. And yeah, we actually find out Keller being a double agent. We find that out pretty early in the movie. But, but yeah, you know, he got the job because the other guy failed to stop Daryl. And, of course, the other guy failed to stop Daryl because he didn't know about Daryl. You know, it, like, basically, the other guy had stuff in place and Keller was probably working right underneath him and, you know, told the these security things to Daryl. And, yeah, and he's probably why Daryl was... You know, at, at first we think, oh, the reason Daryl was able to get past this screening process is because he used his mind to make them think that he belonged in there. But no, it was very likely Keller who forged the... Yeah. And Cameron almost kills his sparring partner, but then gets it under control. Some people have said that this is... that it happens too easily. Um, I, I might talk about it in the next section. The art really is grotesque, visualizing the pain inside the artist's head. He really does an incredible job there, and it actually is, like, I, um, hold on, there was the, let's see, in, I remember the guy being, being in existence, that's almost, without a doubt, the, the Cronenberg movie I've watched the most times. But yeah, he's yeah he's he plays, it's it's Robert A. Silverman, and yeah he in Scanners, Naked Lunch, The Brood, Jason X. Oh right, yeah I do vaguely remember. Yeah, and is that ah uh, that might be all of the oh and Rabid that was also yeah. But, but yeah, I, I really remember him from Existence ma mainly. But, but yeah, you know, you can, you can really understand. I, I, he gives a really great performance. Like, the thing with... I mean, he really... He has almost no lines. So he really... He poured his heart and soul into the few lines. And just the, the way he, he looks at Cameron. You know, uh, you know, Cameron calls out, you know, is, are you in here? Something like that, you know. And without missing, just immediately, the immediate reaction, Ben has no idea who it is. You know, he just says, get away, get get out of here. You know, I, I mean, he, you could maybe, maybe he can tell that it's a new mind. He hasn't heard Cameron's internal voice before, but he's not even a tiny bit interested in meeting this new person. And, you know, uh, Cameron comes closer and he says, he says the words, I need your, I, I, you know, I think you're the only person who can help me. To which Ben responds, then you, my friend, are in a terrible situation. You know, something along those lines. That really is, because, because, yeah, you know, he's not even gonna, yeah, wow, I gotta admit. I have met Aspies, a.k.a. people with Asperger's Syndrome, who would say that exact thing in that exact circumstance. So, yeah, that... 
I, I don't I I don't think I've ever met anyone with schizophrenia. I I um I am aware of some people um in 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 some of my extended family. Um but uh I don't think I met um I I know at least one of them is is dead by now, but Oh, never mind. Yeah, now that I think about it, I I have spent a little time with uh, with um schizophrenics and honestly you know yeah uh, based on at least one schizophrenic that i knew you know some of them like they they you could basically almost you know some some of them can basically pass which i honestly don't know very many i um i know people on the spectrum who can pass but they're doing it intentionally like they're they're imitating other people who they know people don't you know yeah there's a, there's a lot of social pressure for people on the spectrum to to fit in you know but yeah i actually i i did know a person with schizophrenia who like almost everything she said she, you know she sounded she, you you wouldn't guess that she was was schizophrenic but but yeah um, and, and to be, you know, to be clear, she was receiving treatment for it. Uh, you know, I, I, um, yeah, I'm not going to speak to, I, I know very little about schizophrenia, but yeah, um, you know, the, the, um, yeah, I know, I know Aspies who would respond just the way Ben does to, to what Cameron said. And yeah, you know, I really appreciate Cameron tries to talk Ben, it, uh, actually, never mind. yeah, before he tries to talk the gallery owner, whose name escapes me, he tries to talk him into, you know, he, he says, could you arrange a meeting? I want to buy one of his sculptures for my home in Paris, but I, I think I need to talk to the, the artist. And the, the gallery owner is completely adamant. No, that's not going to, you know. And then Cameron says, maybe you could just think about where he lives you know and you know that's the kind of thing like you know it's it's that thing of if i tell you don't think about elephants you're gonna think about elephants so the moment that he says think about where he lives you know that pops up in his head and cameron reads scans that information now that i think about it is that ever explicitly explained by a character i think that actually is just like we realize from from like okay he said think about where he lives and the next thing we know he's going to where the guy lives after you know he he focuses very clearly on the the guy so yeah he read his mind he used telepathy and i i do appreciate like they have a lot of like there's telepathy there's telekinesis there's pyrokinesis you know there's a lot of different psychic abilities because at one point kim sets one guy on fire or was it two guys at least one guy on fire and we see a lot of telepathy and telekinesis you know they're very frequently like influencing people's behavior which is telepathy through the, the mind you know yeah and yeah you know he he tries to talk the gallery owner into helping before he uses that scan of his but but yeah, I really like the scene between Ben and Cameron and the guys and gal with shotgun. I, I really appreciate that. That actually, there is at least one woman killing for Daryl. You know, that's, yeah. Women are, you know, just as capable. You know, it's it's a shotgun. Like, you know, as long, as long as you're strong enough and have some training, you can fire a shotgun. You know, I, I know, I'm not going to get into the, I know some people love to say, oh, you know, there are things men can do that women could never do. I'm not going to get into that here. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, and the, um, hmm. uh, right, right, yeah. Um, right before dying, Ben tells Cameron, you know, you should look, you should find Kim Oprist. And we see the, 
you know, yeah, this, this collective, maybe, of scammers. And I quite appreciate, you know, right before letting in Cameron, the guy scans Cameron, you know, to make sure that it's not one of Daryl's scanners. And Daryl has more, has people attack them as well. Kim sets one on fire with her mind. And we have the, the car. I quite enjoyed the, the car action scenes. Um, I get, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about them in the next section, but yeah. And let's see. Right, you know, Paul tells Cameron that he can scan a computer like, you know, like he can scan another human because they both have nervous systems. And. Yeah, the movie's very critical of Big Pharma, which I quite appreciate. And that's another place where, like, that wasn't a huge, like, let's see, this is this is after the war on drugs started, right? I believe, I'm just very quickly going to look up war on drugs. Let's see, yeah, 1971 was when Nixon... Star yeah, so so you know um yeah, you know, it was it was gutsy to to say that the problem is not drug traffickers, drug cartels, drug dealers, or even people who take drugs. The problem is the the big corporations who aren't careful enough about what they do to the human body. And, yeah, you know, because it was true back then. It just wasn't a popular truth. So a lot of people didn't were not allowed to, you know, go there. You know, in, in this movie, the people who need a drug actually do need... It's a, it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. And, yeah, the... And, and it was created by the carelessness of big pharma and you know today it's it tends to be the the over prescription of the ah what are they called opioids which you know eventually the doctor cuts you off and then you have to go to a drug dealer because you're too hooked on it now you know because the the you know big pharma they make money from regular people taking opioids and they don't care that it destroys you know all these lives. Anyway, um, let's see. Yeah, the you know at one point Kim is like, you know, you know the Keller is like, I you know you should be afraid of me, and she's like, why should I be afraid of you? I came in on on you know my my own, and then she's like, you know I, I forget what he says next. Oh right right yeah he points out that he knows she's not working for with or for Daryl, and she's like. Um, I, wa I want to talk to someone else. I want to see other interrogators. And let's see. Yeah, and and the the people are, you know, the the people at the at the I, I forget what it's called, but there's the the computer place. You know, the, they realize that Cameron must be scanning the nervous system of the computer. And so Keller says, I want to hurt him, possibly kill him. Yeah, this guy is definitely in a high position in an American corporation. No fireworks. Well, nobody told the fireworks that. Some people have said that the idea of a human brain hacking into a computer via a telephone is silly. I'm not really going to argue that it isn't, but I do think it is an interesting exploration of the idea that a powerful computer has a brain not dissimilar from a human brain. You know, the, just... Yeah, this concept that a human that a, that a computer can share some of the otherwise unique properties of a human brain, you know, because as long as we've been seriously studying it, we've known the human brain is like I mean, they talk about today that they're not sure it is possible to for a human being to recreate a human brain in in any form including a a an AI because it's just so unbelievably complex, you know? And like, basically, you know, um, 
Okay, not all living things have brains, but all living things have some sort of, like, driving force, some, something they're trying to do. And complex beings do have brains. And, you know, if you look at, like, monkeys, you know, they can learn some behavior that is otherwise deemed human if you, you know, if you train them like you would a pet. But there's, you know, the, the, a monkey brain... Or is it ape? I, I always get those two mixed up. But, you know, the, their brains are substantially less complex than ours are. So the idea that a computer... And, yeah, I realize I just said that it couldn't be. But when this movie was made, people did think it's just a matter of time before, the, before we can make computers that are as smart as the human brain. And, you know, and, and, and to be clear, we can make computers that can do things that the human brain can't, but that's because we're starting from the standpoint, you know, like um, a, a camera is better at recording an accurate image than the, the you know, the, the human brain didn't really develop to, to, you know, memorize every single detail of a visual if you're only seeing it briefly, which is why witness statements are, you know, you know, trusted way too much by, you know, law enforcement and such. We, you know, are, are the, the eye has developed to very quickly discover, you know, determine from looking at something, is it beneficial? Is it threatening? Is it neither? You know, so when you see something that you think is dangerous, your mind might fill in, you know, or, or hear a noise that you think is dangerous. Anyway... Let's see. Yeah, so, you know, in 1981, this kind of thing was still a new concept. Obviously, by today's standards, it seems silly because we know more. Let's see. Ironside is such a great villain. You know, he points out, I never sent people to kill you. And Revok explains about the, the last pieces of the puzzle of Ephemeral that Paul Ruth is their daddy, which makes it the Paul Ruth truth. Amazing climax, this duel between the brothers. And, let's see. Yeah, that was... And actually, yeah, we only find out at the very, very end that he is straight up a supremacist. Because, yeah, you know, Dr. Paul says that Daryl is dangerous... I think he might even say that he's trying to, to like, rule over people. But some of the things that that Dr. Paul say are later revealed to be lies. So, yeah. That brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. And... Let's see, so the, uh, right, I copied in a bunch of Wikipedia, I'm not entirely sure, let's see, right, and yeah, this I want to briefly, so, you know, the IMDb f frequently asked questions says that, Ephemeral is a fictional drug invented for the film that was given to pregnant women about 30 years before the story opens. The chief function was to quell morning sickness. It caused the children of these women to develop the psychic powers they now possess. It is also used to pacify and sedate scanners, suspending their powers to control others. Though it is a fictional drug, Cronenberg was probably inspired to create it for this film by another well-known drug called Thalidomide, which was also given to pregnant women in 1957. Children born to these women had malformed limbs. And that is the thing, you know, if if we're looking at something, you know, back in back in the 80s and, and, yeah, honestly, further back, 60s, you know, the idea that something could change the human body meant that it must give you superpowers. You know, the, the yeah, when today we know that it's much more likely that it'll just, yeah, have a very negative effect on the on the human body. Now, let's see. The, um, let's 
let's see. Right, so yeah, some, some critic quotes. It does play it too safe story-wise. Maybe. Too little of Daryl. The film shifts to focus on the corporate villain. True, but that is, you know, the thing of... It was late. The... the um, let's see. And... You know, the, uh, originally he wasn't supposed to be the main villain at all. I love the paranoid atmosphere of the film. This is a world where even if you can read people's minds, you still don't know who to trust. Lack's performance is exactly what was desired, is my guess. Kim Obrist even says to him, you, you're barely human. He was left as a derelict, a piece of human junk, deliberately by his father. Untreated and abandoned, but probably monitored, he was the secret ace in the hole his father pulls out when it appears that Consect has completely lost the scanner community to Revic. And that is also, like, again, once you've watched the entire film and you think back, yeah, um, ace in the hole. You know, if, if the... If the the if the if the um, demonstration that is I think the second scene of the film, if that had gone well, then the the you know he didn't need uh, Cameron, but because Cameron is more effective than the other, you know, imagine. If Cameron had been the one to sit there and try to do the demonstration and then Daryl attacks back, you know, maybe it wouldn't, maybe he would have, maybe it wouldn't have gone down that way. Sure. But there is some chance that that leaves, you know, even if there's like a big battle and it's, you know, maybe it leaves both of them completely out of the, the you know, maybe it, maybe both of them end up so injured that they can't that they aren't of use to dr ruth and that is clearly what he thinks of them they're there's something he can use they're not he doesn't consider them human beings anymore clearly you know maybe he did back when he was looking forward to having children but now that they're not the way he wants them he's using them as objects as weapons you know and yeah sure okay that would mean that daryl couldn't lead the the rebel faction but, you know, it's, he's not the only person in that faction. It would just leave a power vacuum. And if they're, you know, if they're willing to, do, to, to follow him and, and kill other scanners, sure, uh, surely at least one of them would be, you know, would try to take power. Cronenberg also finds success in the characterization of everybody, particularly his villain, who is hard to identify. Both people within Consec and the underground are evil and seek nothing but world domination. By having Consec know that a drug made a company, uh, made by a company, gives fetuses this horrible disease, and with Daryl Revic, leader of the underground, killing scanners who do not join them, join him, it makes it hard to know who to root for. On one hand, we have an evil business that dabbles in morally unethical and illegal practices. On the other, we have a ruthless man who will stop at nothing to topple that company. Does the end justify the means? Probably not. Cronenberg never asks you to root for either side in the conflict. However, as he shows both sides to be negative forces, those who control and those who commit violent acts are not to be rooted for. And though this is a topic he will come back to later on in his works, it is one he somewhat toys with in Scanners. It's it's very true. Like I wow, I you know I read that months ago when I copied it into this document. I had forgotten, but yeah, thinking back on the movie. It's true. It's never said that Cameron is the good guy. You know, for, for much of the movie, he's a tool. You know, the, the ending, that's part of why the ending is so creepy. He takes over Daryl's body. And that's clear because the, the very distinct blue eyes of Cameron are now in the... the yeah. You know, and that's also, you know, we see Daryl's eyes go all white and we see the the eyes of Cameron basically explode. And, you know, when that is is happening, he's transferring his mind to, you know, but, but yeah, the movie doesn't say that it's a happy ending. You know, the movie, it's, it's an ending and that's enough because it does, 
you know, uh, uh, let's see. Let's, for example, let's see. The, the, um, yeah, I'm not sure if everyone that Daryl had working for him, if they're all dead. We know that Keller is, and everyone he sent to, to you know, they're all dead or at the very least captured. And, you know, they're, they're not going to be a threat to, but if there are people left working for Daryl, I mean, Cameron now looks like Daryl. He can just go out and tell them, you know, to, to change tactics. And if they refuse, maybe make them kill themselves. You know, he's been making people kill themselves. He's been killing people throughout a lot of the movie, you know. Like, he can control his abilities from after his encounter with the, the guy with the, the heartbeat. So he is choosing to kill. He's not just like, I mean, let's say that he, I don't know, maybe he took the leg off one of them or something to, to slow him down and prevent him from continuing to attack. And if you've watched, yeah, I th you know, the people who are, some people might have guessed what I'm, what I'm referring to here, but yeah, he chooses to kill all of these people. And Kim sets fire to a guy. I mean, yes, that guy did just shoot some of the, the people she trusted. But still, you know, I mean, at the end of it, like, if you can, if you can telep use telepathy to make someone else do what you want, you can just, you know, make them not resist when you tie them up, you know. And, and like, Kim ends up going with Cameron into Consec. So why not just, you know, call up Consec and tell them, you know, there's a scanner for you to interrogate at this particular location. I'm still on mission. Talk to you later. But no, you know, the, the one person, I'm not sure he does kill the guy, the, the last one that he gets some information out of. It's possible he kills him afterwards. I don't think we see what he does after getting information. But yeah, you know, it it is the the... You know, and, and, I mean, Cronenberg isn't really interested in, in all the movies I've seen him make. He's never appeared particularly interested in saying, this person is evil. This person is good. That's not really something that he's that, that he finds all that interesting. And I'm not, you know, I do, I do think that you can tell compelling stories that do include assigning blame. I think Logan is an excellent movie, and it definitely has, you know, there, there's no doubt that there are, you can, you can point to certain characters in that movie and say, that one's evil, that one's good. But it's not something Cronenberg is interested in, and I do really admire that. I, I think this movie is better. For, yeah, I, holy crap, I totally forgot, but it's, it's 100% true. It's because, you know, we're so used to, there's so many movies that tell us this is the good guy and this is the bad guy. And sometimes that is useful. Sometimes it can communicate values. You know, I, I just started watching the second season of Marvel Netflix's Luke Cage, for example, and that definitely has opinions about, you know, what is good to do and what is bad to do. And, and since it is primarily about by foreign black people let's see yeah yeah i think i got them all in there it's important to say not all black people are bad but it is possible for some black people to do the wrong thing because you gotta you you can't really have if, if you're stuck with either of those options you know if you either have black people are bad or black people are good both of those can lead to problems you know people don't tend to behave very well if you tell them that everything they do is bad, but if you tell someone that they can do nothing wrong, they start testing boundaries. We see that in rich people. So, you know, it's, yeah, that show does say, here's, here's some good, here's some bad. And yeah, I just, I really admire that, that Cronenberg doesn't and, and lets us because, yeah, I think a lot, you know, I read reviews of this where people say Daryl is evil, Cameron is good. But, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like, 
Cameron spends almost the entire movie as a corporate stooge. Like, he's a tool. He doesn't even stop and, and question, you know... Because the first thing that happens to him in this movie is that he's captured and then given this drug, and now he can control his powers, and, you know, he... Actually, yeah, come to think of it, like, the first... Wait, is he test... He's testing himself. That's what it is. That's why the thing with the heartbeat. Yeah, he's seeing, okay, how much... How... Can I really kill him by, by focusing on his heart? And then he stops, and it's like, oh, okay, yeah. I'll go out now. You know, I'll... You can, you can send me out now. He's testing, because he's finally in control. He's not used to being in control. So, yeah... And, and, yeah, he spends most of the movie not questioning, you know, why might Daryl be doing this? And, and basically, like, Daryl and Cameron are just two different responses to the same awful behavior. You know, Daryl thinks that he's superior. A lot of children of monsters think that they're superior to their, their parents. And if you're superior to your parents... Who aren't you superior to? You know, if you if you realize it at a young age, I'm I'm not you know, if you realize it later in life, it's not necessarily as a, a big problem. But if you spend some of your childhood thinking, my parents are so beneath me, yeah, you you know, if because your parents are supposed to be the ones that specifically are, you know, they they teach you, they 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 make sure that you are a good person. So if they're not good people, you know. So, so yeah, Daryl thinks that he is better than his parents, and thus everyone. And Cameron, you know, Daddy just made him better. If I keep doing what Daddy wants, maybe Daddy will keep making me better. And that's basically what happens, you know. the, the He goes to the, the hotel, I want to say it is, that he's staying at, and gets a package, and yeah, it's the it's the syringe, and by the time he's injecting himself, he clearly badly needed that shot. So, yeah, and again, you know, a good father, a good parent would help their, their child, even if their child isn't behaving exactly the way they want, you know, they, you, may be, you may be punished to, to make sure they don't do something wrong, but if they're not already doing what you want, then it's, you know, but yeah, he doesn't see him as his son, his offspring. You know, the first thing he says to him is, you're a derelict, you're a piece of human junk. That's not very fatherly. I mean, I guess it depends on what father you have, but it's not very, it's not good parenting. Ah, uh, right, some people say the love story is bad. Was it a love story? I mean, yeah, there's a there's a dude there there's a, a man and a woman and by the end of the movie they have fairly positive feelings for each other, I guess. I don't know, I'm not sure I really I, I didn't it didn't read like a love story to me. I think it was just that there was an expectation at the time that your leading man had to have a leading lady that and they would fall for each other. But yeah, they don't really. They they they're they're basically allies, out of convenience. You know, they they have to work together because there's nobody else. You know. Let's see. Unlike Shivers and Rabbit, which right back to critic quotes, unlike Shivers and Rabbit, which questioned these themes of medical inter intervention technology more broadly. Scanners it ultimately more personal. The film is less about the dichotomy between scanner and human and more about the battle between Vale and Ravik. The way Cronenberg negates a female love interest, O'Neill's character is wasted, puts the focus entirely on the two male characters to the point where their mental sparring takes on a homoerotic subtext. Like homosexuals in an AIDS-afraid early 80s, the scanners are treated as outcasts, and as a result they must sense their kind through mental guessing rather than audible, sub aud audible comments. Connections between scanners had to be made by interpreting subtext. Much like the conservative society had forced gays to keep their sexuality repressed within their minds. That is true. That, there's definitely also that going on. There. Yeah. 
Revic is a contemporary incarnation of Frankenstein's monster unleashed onto this world. He is the product of a scientific breakthrough, a man endowed with exceptional psychic powers, even if it was initially as an unintended and accidental side effect of the drug. Revic is like Hitler wanting his master race to conquer the world, slaughtering what he considers lesser people without a second thought. Now, back to my own comments. So, Cameron is introduced, considered creepy by other people, established to be unhoused, struggling with mental illness. Before we realize that he's the protagonist, it actually appears that he's going to be depicted in a negative light, or I suppose I should say, continue to be depicted in a negative light. At first he is. Today, awareness about an empathy for unhoused individuals is increasing, although it is still a big problem. A lot of people don't want to consider their humanity, but it was extremely bad when this movie came out. When he is given help by a doctor, in part medicinal, he gets it under control and for the rest of the movie holds down a job. He makes intelligent, informed decisions. The mental illness is later revealed to be something that he did not do, he did not himself do anything to cause. It's not that he gave up on life. It's not that he used a lot of drugs. In my opinion, those things do not mean that he should be treated inhumanely, but to many it does, especially back then. And the movie intentionally subverts our expectations. Consec caused the scanners. They may not have meant to, but when they realized that they made them, they try to use it to their advantage rather than try to actually help them. They have a new tool or toy, typical corporation. Dr. Ruth even has the goal to berate Cameron for being unhoused after they caused that. There's a lot of cases today of rich media personalities who are cruel to the unhoused, though they could do a lot to help them and have benefited off the things that render them unhoused. Powerful entity makes a costly mistake, but they don't pay the cost. Regular people do. It's key that Cameron starts out working for the company who did, after all, appear to help him, but he ends up helping, you know, yeah, yeah. once he realizes the truth about them, he, you know, he tries to destroy the, the computer and that whole thing. Again, early on, we think that the company are the good guys. We come to realize that isn't the case. Hopefully inspiring many viewers to ponder if maybe they have let's, maybe they have too positive an opinion of real-life companies. The company created Daryl unintentionally, yes, but they did create him. If not for the company, there wouldn't even be this movement. And the movie does make it clear that the movement is dangerous. It is a threat. Let's see. You know, sometimes... Yeah, and, and perhaps one that must be dealt with because sometimes the mistakes of large companies become very dangerous for regular people. In real life, it's stuff like pollution, financial manipulation, and on whom do they place the burden of fixing their own mistake? A regular person. In fact, someone they hurt. Like Cameron, Daryl is introduced in a way that really subverts our expectations. The random guy, you know, like... Is, is revealed to be the main antagonist. Like, the, there's the there's the demonstration, and the guy says, okay, so I know you heard all this, but I just want to make sure, you know, I'm going to say it again, so everybody's aware. He explains this whole thing. So, I am going to need a volunteer. Anybody. Anybody will want to volunteer, you know, and, and several people are like, I don't, I don't know if I want to, and looking around to see, does, does anybody volunteer? And, you know, it's it's like, today, we know... That's Michael Ironside. Holy crap! You know, I he you know he's got to be a bigger part of this. But people watching this movie had no idea this was the big break for him. So you know, he just you know he's like, I guess nobody else is gonna okay. okay um, I volunteer. You know, it's just and he sits down and and it's like, okay, so so what do I do? As if he doesn't know. Uh, uh okay. If you if you think of something. And, and just just focus on it. Okay, uh, do I have to close my eyes? No, 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 that's not necessary. And, you know, the the other guy starts to, to scan him, and Daryl scans back. And we have the, the head explosion. It's just, yeah, it's, it's... Nobody has been able to forget that scene. And it actually... Because nobody expected the first time... It's like the Spanish expo exposition, you know... Yeah, I decided to make it a Simpsons reference, too. Nobody expected the guy to come down for the demonstration to blow up the other guy's head and turn out to be the, the main antagonist. So, yeah. So, the drug both creates scanners and helps regulate the powers. 
you know, some some people felt that that was like what how could that be? Once it has affected them, their brain struggles to create more of the chemical, but if they are provided the chemical, they function normally. And you know, yeah. You know, some mental illnesses, certainly depression, yeah, that is based at least partially on a chemical imbalance in the brain. Uh, I've, uh, I forget if it's if that's always the case, but certainly for some people, for some people, depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain, and once they're, you know, once it's treated with the the, you know, by professionals, it is it, yeah, it gets to be under control. So and, and I don't I don't blame I, I know a lot of people, you know, not not everybody knows that and that's fine. I don't blame people who you know, reviewed this negatively and said it doesn't make sense that the drug can both can do both of those things. It can logically only do one of those things. It's just that, you know, I mean, I, I know because some of the, you know, I know psychiatrists. I've I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the mind's control over the body. You know, I, I respect the, the mind's control over the body. Now, let's see. Oh, right. I actually wrote, yeah, months ago when I was preparing this, I wrote to to make sure to bring up whether or not the action gets repetitive and or tedious since so much of it consists of shotgun fire and use of psychic powers. Yeah, I, yeah, because I, I don't, I'm not sure I found a review that said that they felt that way. Otherwise, I probably would have copied that in. But, but yeah, no, they, they did a really great job. Like, Okay, so let's see the first. Oh, right. I I just wanted to very quickly. Apparently, I didn't copy it in, but yeah, the the first scene of Cam, you know, the the very first. In, yeah, in case it's been a while since you watched it or you just forgot or whatever, the very first scene we see is Cameron being, you know, he he focuses on the on the woman in the in the food court. I think it's called, and you know, then he's he's uh, Trank darked tr Trank Trank darted by the the consec people and then we see the head explosion scene you know after that it only starts after that originally cronenberg wanted to put the head exploding scene first and i i get it uh i i forget why it was that it was moved but i think it was something like that he was worried that people were gonna leave once they had seen the head explosion. So he wanted to make sure that when people were watching the head exploding, they were already, they wanted to know what was going on with Cameron. And you can see how, yeah, because if, if it starts with the head explosion and then we see Cameron, then the, ple the scene plays differently. Because now we're watching a scanner who doesn't know he's a scanner. But when it's the first scene you see if you don't already know, you know, ideally you watch this movie not knowing too much about the movie. You don't know what's going on with Cameron at first, you know, and then the, the, yeah, because, because the head explosion scene, he explains scanning, you know, it, it, by, by the, by the time that he asks for volunteers, you have a, a, bare bones grasp on what the the psychic you know at least some of what they can do you know but if you watch Cameron struggle and and seemingly affect the woman by f focusing on her you know you're you're wondering what is what is even going on you know it not not to the point where you're like okay this is too out there I'm just I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna find a different movie to watch but to the point where you 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 got to find out what's going on there. Yeah. Uh let's see. Yeah, so yeah. The the um right, and I also just briefly want to note the head explosion has its own section on the film's Wikipedia page. So, you know, if you want to know details about that, I I direct you to that. I would just be quoting that. I don't know anything that isn't on the Wikipedia. Now, yeah, the the so the action scenes. Okay, so it starts with him blowing up a head, and that's actually it's interesting. That doesn't happen 
again in the entire movie. And that's uh, I've heard that that was something that some apparently some people were bothered by that. They thought that it was going to happen every so often. The the way that you know the one of the first things you see in the original Terminator is the Terminator killing someone, and you yeah it's not a spoiler to say that happens again. the The Terminator kills people more than just the first time you see him. But apparently in some of the sequels, in a, there's more than one exploding head or some something. But anyway, yeah, so, you know, he blows up the guy's head. And then, you know, the, there's that doctor who's who's going to use the, the shot on him to, to knock out the, the powers. But Daryl makes him, you know, inject himself, which we later find out that does nothing. You know, it, it has no effect on a human body that isn't... Yeah, a non-scanner body. But yeah, so then he's he's in the car. And let's see. So he makes the... Yeah, Daryl uses the, the powers to make one of the cars just drive straight into the building and blow up. And then he sends some of the people out. And... Or maybe they got out because they were, like, personally familiar with the person and were really upset that they died. Or something, you know, something. And then he... T he takes over one of the guys and shoots the two other guys and then makes the guy shoot himself. Then the next time, I think the next action scene is when the shotgun people, including one woman, uh, you know, yeah, uh, attack Ben and, you know, Revik says later that they weren't there to attack uh, Cameron, you know. And, yeah, you know, they fire their shotguns. And there's all this art, and some of the art is actually damaged. I think one piece might even have been destroyed by the, the gunfire. And then Cameron makes them fly backwards. Then we get to the... Yeah, then there's the, the car scene where they shoot, they fire their shotguns from one car into another. Then we have Kim setting that one guy on fire. And let's see, then there's the part where... Kim makes one of the guards think that it's his mother and he's ashamed and he can't shoot. And yeah, very clever. And then we have the final big duel between the two brothers, which is also just unlike anything we'd seen earlier in the movie. You know, it, there's maybe some resemblance, mild resemblance to the head exploding, but it's, yeah, you know, and, and it is also, you know, that's what it, the head exploding, that's what it looks like when someone like Daryl or Cameron, if they just want to kill someone, you know, even another scanner, they can do that. You know, they can blow up the, the person's head. Cameron chooses not to do that. But the, the let's see, which still doesn't necessarily mean that he's the good guy, just that, you know, he doesn't want, like, it could raise questions for the company maybe, but yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, the, the duel at the end, that's what it looks like when you have two scanners that are equally good, and the, the best two scanners, in fact. And just, yeah, you know, you've got the, you've got the veins on the arms and, and on the face, and the eyes turning white, the eyes exploding, and Cameron's old body catches fire, and when Kim goes in, it's like, like, really badly burnt, you know, and no, not still alive. Yeah, I, um, yeah, great variety to, to the action. I, I, I'm really impressed by how well they, they did at that. And yeah, you know, obviously I didn't want to give all that away in the, in the review itself. And yeah, so the effects, like I said, the, the head explosion, just go to Wikipedia. There's, it has its own section. But yeah, you know, the, the, um, let's see, it's, you know, part of what makes it so impressive is that we can clearly see, like, no, that is that is a real arm that you've put these, you know, little little veins that, that bulge like that. And that's also, like, outside of Cronenberg, that wasn't something you usually saw. I've, I've watched at least a hundred different horror movies. I haven't seen, like, there, you know, you have limbs getting cut off. You have, like, body parts, you know, yeah, might get... You know, not quite blown up like the, the head at the start of this, but, like, blown off by a gun or something. But I have not seen very many horror movies. Let's see, there's... Do I want to give that away? Because it's technically a spoiler for that film. Um, I guess... 
yeah, ultimately, I don't think I want to give that away. But anyway, yeah, the the bulging veins and the stuff on the face and, and all this stuff, just, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, you know, if you've watched the entire movie, yeah, now I remember, this was why I put it in the, in the, if you've watched the entire movie, you know by now, it really, like, the very start and the very end have some really extreme effects. But throughout the movie, a lot of it is, like, people getting shot by guns, and it's just fairly basic squibs, you know. There's the, um, yeah, so, you know, that's not, let's see, yeah. All Cronenberg films are about identity, and, yeah, you know, Cameron starts out as unhoused and hated for it, then he becomes, you know, a, a like, he's not regular member of society in, in all ways, maybe, but, you know, when he go like, think of the contrast between when he's going around eating other people's leftovers in the food court. Which, yeah, that actually, that also works really well with the AIDS metaphor, come to think of it. Because that is, yeah, you know, if, if you... If you engage with someone who isn't... Because, yeah, you know, when we watch him eat the, the food... You know, we, we come to think, oh, there could be there could be some kind of infection. You know, it, it, uh, not infection. Uh, he could get infect. No, that's not, uh, never mind. There there could be something in there that in in the food that the other person was just carrying. Uh, you know, but he might get infected, or the other person might also be infected, but uh, it might hit him harder or anything. Anyway, think about how different that. The, the contrast between that and then him approaching the gallery owner and, like, perfect cover story, you know, yes, I am new to this gallery. I would like to buy one of your most expensive pieces. I have a place in Paris, but I would like to talk to the artist himself. You know, it's it's like there's there's no sense, like, um, he's he's basically a new man, so to speak. And it's because he has gotten the mental health thing under control. And that is the thing. Like, some people are defined by their struggles with uh, mental health. But other, you know, some people can pass, can, can be completely convincing as not having any mental health issues. Let's see. And yeah, and I already talked about the ident how how Cameron and Daryl both form an identity in response to basically being abandoned by their their father and never knowing their mother. Right. So yeah, um, some people compare said this was like the best of the X Men, or, or it was a better X Men movie than any of the X Men movies. Which I mean. There are definitely things I love about the first two movies. And like I've said, you know, Logan, Deadpool 2, you know, yeah. Yeah, this is this is the best of the of the X-Men movies. Uh, Deadpool 2 and Logan are better movies than this, but this is a better movie than any movie currently out live action that has X-Men in the title or Dark Phoenix. I've, did that one maybe not have X-Men in the title? Anyway, yeah. And, yeah, one of the major characters believes in their supremacy, another fights to stop him, so that's very Magneto and Xavier. Different scanners slash mutants do different things with their powers, some embracing the violence they can excel at, while others try to use it for good, and yet others do unusual things to cope with life with the powers. So, Ben. Let's see, and... Right, I guess I did already say this, but but yeah, you know, Vale is so isolated and stunted socially that Lack is perfect for the role. And yeah, you know what? Come to think of it, at the end of the day, I... Yeah. What we have here is not a failure to communicate. It is not a main character who's... where, where the actor does a bad job. It is... A leading man who himself is not the most charismatic. That's really what we're dealing with here. And that is actually quite interesting. And and yeah, a number of people said he's a bad actor. He, he doesn't... It's not 
but he is convincing as what as the way the role is written when you no that's true yeah i hadn't quite it, it was only just now that i that it completely fell into place for me but yeah he is it, it is a you know when this movie came out we were used to the leading man is a good guy he's likable and he has the like yeah and and here we have a protagonist who's not necessarily the most likable and not and a lot of people tr have trouble empathizing with him even you know watching the whole movie and yeah i i understand that like a lot of people do struggle to empathize with people on the spectrum i wish that weren't so but that is i've i've met a lot of people who just can't you know just yeah and the yeah so you know some people found him difficult to empathize with he's not really heroic as such you know and let's see yeah i think that is pretty much all that i had to say ah uh, let me think yeah and and the ending is not you know like i've i've watched a lot of 80s movies where the ending you know if it's an action movie which this definitely qualifies as an action movie there's a lot of action in it the action movie ends with the hero like walking off and you know and like exciting music is playing and there's you know and and yeah here we have a very creepy ending and it's like you you get this close up of the guy that you've spent the whole movie being afraid of but now his eyes are like i i really admire that that was cuz i i'm I will grant, when I first watched this movie, I did not understand the ending. And there are a number of, like, reviews and such where people, you know, write, I, I mean, I, I like some of it, but I don't understand the ending. And I, I don't think that Cronenberg, I don't think it's accidental. There are a lot of his endings, a lot of his movies end in a way that leaves some people, and, and that's not, ah, crap, that sounds, that sounds like an insult. You know, like, like, I, yeah, I used to be one of them, and I, there's probably, like, I don't know if I'm going to understand all the, movie, you know, some of them I've, uh, at first to some audiences including myself it, you know it seems confusing it, it's not necessarily that it doesn't resolve things but it's like what, what is that is that good or is that bad am i supposed to be happy or sad about this ending and a lot of movies basically spoon feed us that you know the, yes definitely this was a happy ending yes definitely this was a sad ending and with some of his movies, you find yourself wondering, which is it? And and it, it kind of, it provokes an anxiety because we're used to being, like, we're getting we're used to getting a little pat on the head and, to, yes, you understood. That's so good. You know, now the credits are rolling and you can leave the theater and, and it's done, you know. But if we're left wondering, that can be very, like, we you know we we don't always know exactly what to do with that you know because it's 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 a movie though like we're supposed to when the when the end credits roll we're supposed to understand what the movie was about and it's all resolved and we cared about the lead and we're glad that the villain is dead like all of these things David Cronenberg leaves up to us and yeah I think that is exactly the the right choice you know I I. I'm not interested in seeing him make, you know, Deadpool 2, Logan, or, you know, these, these various movies where it is clear, like, yeah, so, so you know, I'm, I, I'm glad those movies exist, but I think it would be very boring if we only got one type of movie, and, yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's really, really important, I, I think... I'm going to see if I can, I, you know what, I'm going to write that down so I don't forget. C 
Cronenberg doesn't want us to know if the ending is happy or sad, if, let's see, the characters good or evil, he wants us to think about these things and make up our own minds on it. There we go. 